Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, and this is episode 26. My name is Dominic, and my co-host's name is Janice, and you will hear from him a little bit later. Today, we are welcoming back returning guest Angel Millar. Angel is a well-known lecturer on Freemasonry, initiation, and esotericism, as well as an artist and a student of the martial arts. Listen to our first talk with Angel back in episode number 17. In that episode, we discussed some of the concepts presented in his new book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality, Craftsman, Warrior, Magician. But we were able to dive a little bit deeper in this episode after having the opportunity to read the book now that it's available. And we highly recommend you get a copy. It's published through Inner Traditions, and we found it to be very thought-provoking and an enjoyable read. Being that it is currently March 2020, we'd like to acknowledge the difficulty much of the world is facing during this global pandemic and extend our condolences to anyone directly affected by this tragic situation. In an effort to help our cottage industry community of craftsmen, artists, authors, readers, mediums, and spiritual workers, we would like to make a habit of highlighting a few, um, and we'll do that now before we begin the interview. Considering the economic ripples that are making its way through society, sometimes the aforementioned independently employed individuals and entrepreneurs are potentially affected more dramatically. So uh, today we'd like to remind you of the work of the multifaceted blacksmith Marcus McCoy. You can hear our talk with him in episode number 14. Among other things, he runs Troll Cunning Forge, and we would recommend you go check out his Etsy shop. He's got all sorts of cool items there, um, hand-forged ritual objects such as candle scribes, nails, talismans, blades, and a lot more. So highly recommend his stuff, very high quality. And he uh, works with the alchemical philosophy of quenching the steel, taking on the qualities of those things that it is quenched in. So for instance, um, based on the purpose of a particular object, Marcus would add herbs and oils to the bath and quench the steel in that. And the thought is that the steel would then take on the properties of those things that were added to the quench. I hope I explained that right. Check out his Etsy shop. He also has an Instagram. You can check that out as well. We'd also like to highlight our good friend Balthazar of Balthazar's Conjure. You can hear our talk with him in episode 19. Balthazar is a spiritual life coach, a root worker, and a medium. He works mainly in African-American Conjure, but he's been influenced by his training in Espiritismo Cruzado and Solomonic Magic. He runs the awesome YouTube channel, Balthazar's Conjure. And if you're listening, Balthazar... Uh, it's been a little while since you put a video out. Come on, man. Pick it up. We're, we're waiting. We've got fans here who want to see a video. Balthazar offers a few different services. Um, we would recommend the root work consultation and reading. Uh, after he does his reading and assessment, he recommends a very tailored spiritual service for your case, and it's, it's all case by case. He does the work in his altar room, and he provides you with images of, of the working after it's completed and he also stays in touch with his clients so they're not left hanging and he he's there to answer questions and support them as the process unfolds so very highly recommended again that's balthazar and you can find him at balthazarconjure.com we dedicate this episode to hermes and asclepius May any merits we accumulate doing this work be extended to all sentient beings so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening.
It is our pleasure to have Mr. Angel Millar back on the show. Um, we talked to Angel, oh, I don't even know, a year, maybe a little more than a year ago. And that was before your book was out, and now it is out. And so we'd love to talk to you about that and everything you've got going on now. Welcome to the show, Angel. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, welcome, Angel. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, Janice is here. Hi, Janice. Hey. We both loved the book. Um, Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it seems to be very well received. So far, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd love to talk about the, the three different aspects of craftsman, magician, warrior. Sure. But we also definitely want to talk about the, the real kind of meat and bones underneath all of that. So yeah. maybe we can start with um, some of the key, key elements. Um, we can start with the craftsman, but this, this kind of pertains to the craftsman. I really liked how you, uh, you were talked about memory, the importance of memory. Right, it seems right. to be a real foundational uh, idea in, yeah. this, in this work. So would you mind maybe talking about uh, the importance of memory and how that ties into this whole story? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, so memory in regards to spirituality is important for a couple of reasons. And um, one reason is uh, there's a lot of memorization with, uh, with certain uh, organizations and an oral tradition um, that you find not just within esotericism today, but oral tr traditions going back into you know, the ancient past. And, uh, you know, even today in Islam, um, uh, it's considered to be like, um, uh, I forget the term now, but a special, uh, uh, a, a special elevated category if, if, of individual if you are kind of memorize the, uh, the whole Quran. I think it might be Hafiz. And, um, you know, so memorizing the whole Quran is, is considered to be really important. And, um, and, you know, that's not the only tradition, of course, in, you know, Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma. Uh, memorization of the Vedas was pretty standard. And, of course, at one point, uh, they, they weren't written down at all. And they were simply memorized over, you know, hundreds of years or more than that. And, uh, and uh, with, with the knowledge becoming expanded and, and new uh, aspects of mythology added in and that memorized as well. And, uh, you know, even in, even in, uh, in the West with, you know, the, the poetic Edda, which records the mythology of the Norse, um, you know, records the mythology uh, that was around a few hundred years before and that had really been passed along orally as well, with some of it probably being lost along the way. But uh, so, you, so you have in in uh, in antiquity this oral traditions across the globe, and then in, in modernity, uh, in the modern age, you have uh, esoteric societies um, that, that emphasize uh, learning the ritual or, or or having some kind of oral tradition within it. And probably most notably, Freemasonry, we have to memorize the rituals, and often before you're before you go on to take a further degree or maybe asked to uh, recite by memory sort of very lengthy passages of um, Masonic ritual as well. So you, so you have that as, as integral to the spiritual traditions, uh, but then you also have this notion of uh, memory as something sort of uh, more um, metaphysical and profound. And, um, and that is, you're not just remembering uh, particular passages or particular uh, myths or particular scenes or scenarios within myths or particular laws or anything like that. But you're remembering, um, in a sense, the golden age or the uh, the age of, of enlightenment from which we have departed over time. So in Hinduism, you have this notion of the yugas, uh, beginning with the Golden Age or the Sattva Yuga and then ending up in the uh, the Iron Age or the Kali Yuga, where, which we're allegedly in today, where everything is in chaos and uh, corrupt individuals are, are in charge and the family is in total disarray and is destroyed and uh, brother will fight brother and this kind of thing. And um, so being in this kind of age, uh, the ritual is a... Uh, reorientating us the the initiation ritual reorientates us towards the uh, golden age and what it was like when everything was in harmony and so on 
And, um, and so you have this uh, myth where uh, memory is emphasized, so probably most famously in the West, you know, Jesus um, uh, breaks bread and, and uh, gives wine and says, you know, eat and drink this in remembrance of me. So remembering Jesus is important, and the Eucharist is a remembrance of Jesus. In Sufism, uh, the main ritual is zikr, which just means literally remembrance, remembrance of Allah. And, um, you know, even in non-monotheistic traditions as well, you know, such as uh, the Norse mythology, um, you have uh, Odin and his, uh, he has two pet ravens, uh, Yugin and Munin, or mind and memory. And, um, and he, at one point in, uh, in, in Norse mythology, he says he, f- he fears that uh, mind will fly away and not come back. Or, or maybe what we might call, uh, you know, conscious thoughts or thoughts of, of the moment. Uh, but he fears even more that his memory will not return. And, uh, and as well, there's also a myth where Odin sacrifices an eye to the well of Mimir, which means the well of the rememberer. And uh, at the end of time, he, he will also ride to, uh, to Mimir, the rememberer as well. So there's this idea that there, there must be some knowledge that is... Uh, prior to the gods themselves uh, that even the gods have to remember but uh, in, a, in a ritual sense uh, the ritual is a kind of remembrance or retracing of steps back to uh, back to the golden age or to give us some kind of memory of the golden age that we've forgotten you know I, I want to jump in here and say uh, what you just said is interesting because I have read that there is a connection between uh, Emir the sort of primal Right, giant yeah. and Mimir. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting because remembering is sort of like putting back the bo- together the body of the cosmic human. Yeah, so Ymir is the giant for, that was slain by the uh, Odin, Vili, and V, the three so primordial gods, and then from the body of Ymir, the world is made, and his flesh is, becomes the earth, and his bones become the mountains, and so on. And in, yeah, so that's right. I've also heard that there's a connection between, or at least uh, an etymological connection between Ymir and Mimir. And um, so, yeah, it seems to be that um, uh, it is remembering this sort of primordial um, condition in a way, right? And there's a, also the motif common to both of them of the severing of uh, of, of body parts, because with Mimir, the yeah. head is severed, and with Ymir, his body is cut apart. Right, right. That's right. So that's interesting. And it seems like one thing I got from um, this section of the craftsman component of your book is that the ri- even the rituals themselves that are preserved by the traditional orders are the, the very symbols themselves are a form of memory. And I like yeah. what you say about how that imprints the soul with a certain pattern. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, even in um, Freemasonry, although if you were to ask a Freemason, well, does it somehow allude to a knowledge that's uh, of the Golden Age? I think most Freemasons would say no. But uh, when you think about it, that even there in Freemasonry, you find this because there's the uh, there's the emblem or symbol of Noah's Ark, which is you know clearly uh, alluding to uh, knowledge before the flood. And um, and then there's the two pillars that you find in the fellow craft degree, and uh, and in every lodge as well. But if you look at the old charges, which were these uh, myths recorded prior to Freemasonry, so going back into around 1400 AD, uh, that we have the earliest evidence of anyway, so about 600 years, uh, you have these strange myths uh, that were all recorded by the Stonemasons Guild in Great Britain. And um, they're quite weird, but in in there it says that uh, um, uh, a blacksmith called Tubal uh, creates created these two pillars, one out of marble and one out of metal, I think, or maybe out of stone, and uh, inscribed uh, all of the uh, arts the, and sciences that mankind knew at that point on these pillars, um, b- because they thought that the world was going to be destroyed by fire or flood again. So. They want to preserve this sort of primordial memory, and then these two pillars turn up in the Masonic Lodge later on. And and these uh, myths were actually collected by the early Freemasons. 
Yeah, the myths of Tubal Cain are intriguing to me. They're really fascinating. To the figure of Tubal Cain uh, yeah. is is kind of that that um, primitive craftsman, and I I like yeah. I like how you see into sort of uh, discussing the the mysteries of uh, initiatic blacksmithing. Right. Yeah. That's right, which is really a precursor, a sort of ancient precursor of uh, alchemy. But yeah, the, the the blacksmith had his own uh, guild and initiatic rituals. And in some senses, is, is very much like an ancient kind of Freemasonry, his initiation rituals, performing as some kind of priest, uh, having initiatic secrets, but also uh, uh, some kind of, um, well, also a, a literally a, uh, a, an art that they would perform, uh, that being a you know, metallurgy as well. So, yeah, I, I, I really, I was really impressed in this book because you tie these ideas together in a coherent and systematic way, but you keep it interesting. You know, you, it, there's a momentum in reading it where after a while I started to say to myself, okay, like I can see why he introduced these ideas here because they're forming the foundation for deeper for deeper uh, concepts later that build on it. And I like how the phases of, uh, you know, the three stages sort of build on one another in a way, but at the same time support one another in a way. It, yeah. It's very interesting. Right. And yeah. then there's a connection to the ages of the world in the reflection right. of the three stages of initiatic spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we both really liked how you, you tied in uh, memory and initiation because they are so intimately intertwined and tied this all in with the the ages. Um, and maybe we could talk right. about that, the gold, silver, bronze, and iron. You've already talked about sure. gold a little bit, and I want to talk yeah. about gold more, but maybe can you explain those ages to the audience a little bit so they know what we're talking about? Sure, sure. Well, it's basically the, the notion that... Um, at some point in the in the ancient past, maybe thousands or millions of years ago, uh, there was a, a golden age that, where in which everything uh, was in harmony and mankind was in harmony with nature and the animals and vice versa and and all all of the existence was in harmony with divine law and with uh, the creator. And then there was a, a kind of decline through the ages in which things became more and more um, egocentric and materialistic and, um, and individualistic in a way. And um, the, in Hinduism, the, the, as I mentioned, the first is the Satva Yuga, and then you end up in the Dark Age or the Iron Age or Kali Yuga. But uh, this notion of a particularly a Golden Age and an Iron Age and a Bronze Age and so on, um, of course, is not related to the historical notions of an Iron Age and a uh, Bronze Age when people were using those metals. Um, it comes from the ancient Greek uh, poet Hesiod. And um, Hesiod... Uh, described how the gods had made a golden race and then a silver race and then a bronze race and then finally an iron race and and the golden race of beings uh, again lived in harmony and were peaceful and lived long healthy lives and then the silver race was similar but not quite as good and then the bronze uh, bronze race was more warlike and then finally you get down to uh, the iron race and they're the most warlike of all beings and are sort of bloodthirsty and and uh cantankerous and uh and troublemakers and and uh probably not able to sustain any kind of society because they're just all against each other so that's that's the uh, that was Hesiod's notion. So there's a decline from the gold, silver, bronze to the Iron Age. And, and again, you find um, to a certain extent, uh, particularly this Iron Age or the Kali Yuga is reflected in Norse mythology as well with this notion of uh, the Wolf Age of Ragnarok when a brother will fight brother and there'll be warfare and uh, treachery and... and um, uh, a time of war between the gods and uh, their enemy, the giants, eventually, which in which everything will be destroyed. And then it will start again. And it's very notable as well that uh, it, in in the poet Hegeda, um, it says that the, the gods first, when the first thing that the gods did was to establish uh, golden temples and uh, forges 
and um, you know, forges for metalwork, and uh, and that they had an abundance of gold. So it's, it seems to suggest that the early time of the gods was the golden age, and then at the end, of course, you have Ragnarok or war, and uh, presumably that would be uh, associated with iron, with weapons uh, such as spears and swords as well. So, so you have a similar kind of descent. Sure, and it seems. I mean, right now, especially, it, it definitely seems like we are in that Kali Yuga. I mean, it's hard, yeah. to, it's hard to deny that in March of 2020 right now. Definitely. But, um, while there's a chronological element to these ages, um, I think you argue in the book, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the gold in age is, is still available. And, and part of uh, the idea of the initiation is to bring man back to that golden age at least uh, for himself yeah so a part of the reason for the uh, initiation ritual is to get to give the initiate a kind of glimpse of the golden age in a sense and um yeah so there's often uh, references to some primordial past or primordial condition or to to a time when things were all in balance or something like that and um you know in freemasonry there's a the uh, it's allegedly taking place during the building of uh, Solomon's Temple, for example. Mm-hmm. But um, but you find other reference uh, references to other times as well. The, the, you often to uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, for example. Uh, in the Golden Dawn, there are associations with the Garden of Eden, uh, and uh, in in the Tarot as well. You have the lovers where they're placed in the Garden of Eden, and then. Uh, the devil card with the same male and female are chained to this uh, this uh, this creature, and that would seem to represent the the Kali Yuga. So you have again this idea of a descent. So would you say that the Golden Age is is comparable to Nirvana? I mean, you could you could look at it in one sense as being like that, but I don't think that's what's implied. I think okay. it, it's more like um, uh, it's more the idea that there literally was. Uh, a, a time in which everything was in harmony, but um, but obviously, if you're not in that world, then um, <clears throat> if you're not in that time, if you are in the Kali Yuga, um, then t- you can. Uh, it would seem to be suggested, uh, kind of create a golden age uh, consciousness within yourself. But that might also mean uh, uh, changing your your lifestyle as well, so to be more in a, in tune with that. Yeah, and I was I was going to say it does seem implicit that the ages are both um, chronological and mythological, and in the sense that they're mythological, they're also atemporal, atemporal and cyclical. Yeah, but they could also represent a dis, the descent. Um, where, whereas there's a there's a you could say there's a progression of time but there's also a descent from the uh golden age of of consciousness in the spirit uh you know downward into uh, materialization or incarnation from a gnostic perspective um and then that connects in with uh the cases that you were t- that you talk about uh this is one of my favorite things about the book the way you integrate these different things cuz this is a mm-hmm. Definitely was a major sort of wake up point for me when I realized that these the idea of um, the different strata of society and the ages and states of consciousness are all sort of different facets of a greater mystery of being. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, and, And that, I mean, I really, really appreciate how you link those things together. And I also, I also think it's kind of interesting to reflect upon the fact that when you enter into this path of initiatic spirituality, you began at the craftsman stage. So right. you, be, you began at the demiurgic stage. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you start at the point of, of really the God of this world. You start, you start at the creative point point and but the but the creative material is actually the the your own soul it right is the, the prima materia at right least, at least that's what i feel like you're getting at in there yeah yeah and you know i definitely mentioned uh 
speaking of the demiurge, you know, Plato referring to the creator as a craftsman and, um, Iamblichus, uh, uh, the Syrian Platonist, uh, also refers to the creator or the, the originator or God as, uh, as, the, as the craftsman as well. And then that shows up a couple of thousand years later in Freemasonry as the great architect as well. And then, of course, the other question is, well, what is the substance the, that he's building with? And uh, that's, that's a very interesting question, too. Yeah. Yeah, and in Plato, of course. Mm? I was going to say, and you know, I like that you don't get caught in a purely negative perception of the of the figure of the demiurge, because if we, right now. yeah, yeah. You know, if we stay attached to that idea, if you're trying to apply this to your own development, that's going yeah. to create a negative association within your own consciousness. Yeah, and I don't really, I don't really see. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see Plato referring to this demiurge or the craftsman in a negative way, or or Iamblichus referring to the craftsman in a negative way either. So, um, I mean, I know that there is this element in Gnosticism where it's considered to be, you know, this uh, illusory god, and there's another god beyond that. But um, yeah, that's not really particularly my view. Well, and, and the the Golden Age could be also compared in a biblical or Abrahamic sense to the Eden, Edenic yeah. state, as it's referred to in like mystical iterations of Christianity, for instance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's right. To Eden, yeah. It reminded me of how Jesus does talk about the kingdom of heaven. Um, you see, the, right. see it a lot in, in the Gospel of Thomas, where the kingdom is is more of a state of being rather than a geographical place necessarily. Yeah. So we're kind of talking a lot about the craftsman and I think we could probably spend the whole time in the craftsman. It's, it's a super interesting part of the book. Um, I want to talk about a little bit, if, if you don't mind the, the general perception and the worldview of primordial sure. man, um, as opposed to uh, how we perceive the world. I think it's, it was striking one of my favorite parts of the book, I actually copied it down here. It's a paragraph. I'm going to read okay. it if you guys don't mind. Okay. Um, no. Please do. For the modern spiritually inclined individual, theory and symbolism represent his way of interpreting the world in relation to the divine. Consequently, while there are always exceptions in general, he enacts rather than acts and symbolizes rather than embodies. In contrast, primordial man's knowledge came through experiences, through aesthetics, and through a way of being in the world. For primordial man, the sun is not primarily a symbol. It is an ordinary miracle that lights the world. The stars are not symbols, but that which enables him to navigate. A sheep is not a symbol, but a living being, a livelihood, and necessary sacrifice, and food. Although man-made, a sword, too, is not primarily a symbol. It is a tool that he has trained himself to wield and that he uses to protect himself. To the primordial man, things are realities first and symbols second. He is immersed in a reality or in a super-reality in which all is one self-sustaining and mysterious. I really loved that. Would you be able to maybe speak to that a little bit? Because I, I think it's it's important, this this paradigm of the prim- primordial man and, and symbolism, how, how all that looked to him. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I guess so. Then the question is, uh, you know, why symbolism, or or what kind of symbolism? And um, you know, one of the one of the the problems um, with esoteric orders today is that uh, the symbol symbolism can become incredibly complex and uh, removed from yeah. reality. Whereas if you look at something like runes, which are you know considered to be magical. Uh, signs the, uh, which can be used even in spells and this kind of thing and uh, embodiments of primordial knowledge when you when you look at um what they're actually representing it's not some weird um esoteric concept or some uh, some archangel uh, on some sphere of the of a tree of life or something like that it's it's you know it represents a tree or it represents uh, man or or fighting or sailing or something like that and um, all of these are in one sense are all completely ordinary everyday activities and everyday things you know the sun as well the ocean um, but at the same time the 
obviously they're seen to embody some kind of uh, mystery as well at the same time. And, um, you know, we've kind of lost sight of that because we don't really, uh, we don't really inhabit nature anymore or natural processes. And even in our work, we're probably not even making the whole of anything. Um, you know, even if you're, let's say you're, you're making, uh, fashion, which is, you know, unlikely in this day and age, you would actually be producing it. But if you are, you're, you know, you're not making a whole pair of jeans. You're me, you're pretty endlessly sewing on the pocket yeah. and then somebody else is endlessly sewing up the seams. Uh, it's called piecework. So we're sort of very abstracted and, um, we don't really have this relationship with nature at all. And I think one of the downsides of that is, um, so then we start to look at uh, nature as symbolic. So the sun is a symbol for us, um, but it, it's not a symbol for ancient men because, you know, the sun woke him up and when it went down, then it was time to sleep. And uh, he knew that, uh, that this, the sun, you know, in a sense gave life to crops and seasons and so on. Whereas, you know, we can eat summer fruit in the middle of winter and um, and we can wake up at two in the morning when it's uh, totally dark out and put the lights on and it can be like day. And so, the, the, the you know, the miracle of ordinary things has been lost to us, really. And, uh, and sometimes we're even a, a bit annoyed by nature, you know, that it's raining or something. And, um, yeah, and, you know, for people who are interested in the esoteric or magic or mysticism, um, you know, it's important to be able to experience or at least appreciate that these things are experiences first. And, uh, you know, another uh, symbol that gets talked about a lot is gold. You know, people will say, well, it's a metal that doesn't rust or is a metal that looks a bit like the, the sun's rays, you know, the same sort of color, which isn't actually really totally true at all. Um, because actually one of the, the qualities of metal is that uh, uh, if if you have a gold ring, for example, um, it doesn't look yellow. It, the reason it looks gold is because uh, where, where it's dark, it's extremely dark, and where it's bright, it's extremely bright. And you can and you can see that if you look at, say, a painting of a, of a, of a metal object or a gold object, then you'll see that a lot of it is actually very dark. But we we sort of have this more like childlike approach to it. Like gold is kind of bright and yellow. That's not really true. And and gold is a bit like the sun. But actually, you know, for for ancient man, gold was an aesthetic because uh, you know why why do why do when you go into a, a museum and you see these gaudy thick gold frames around these ancient paintings or you know medieval paintings or paintings from a couple of hundred years ago and you think good grief they're terrible taste you know these really <laughs> bold gaudy gaudy gold frames you know well, why is that and then why were the thrones of the king or queen gold as well and why in japan or traditionally in Jap- japanese culture why is the inside of the uh, of the of the soup bowl um, a uh, famiso soup? Why is the inside gold traditionally where you put the soup so you couldn't see the gold? Uh, why not on the outside? And the answer is because it's aesthetic and um, it's a it's a lived experience because it's aesthetic. And the reason you have gold in all those situations is that. If if you have dark, thin, thin, dark, cloudy miso soup in a bowl that has gold on the inside, the light shines through, so you get a different experience of the soup. And if you have it on a on a monarch's uh, throne or on a on the frame of a gold painting, uh, the fire or the torches in the, of natural flame in the room will will reflect on those uh, gold. Um, on the gold throne or the gold frame and will illuminate the room, but also illuminate, you know, the painting or whatever else as well in a particular way. It's a, a very warm light, right? Which is a, a, a kind of pleasing light for us. So it's an aesthetic experience first, but we've reduced everything to symbols and things are symbols, but if you don't understand there's an aesthetic experience that goes along with that as well, then you're kind of missing 50% really because we've made it, when you make it a symbol, you make it all intellectual, but actually it's all, it's largely aesthetic really. Yeah. The, 
the the aesthetic function stimulates the intuition. And, yeah, and that's right. When it's powerful enough, it actually takes you out of the intellectual mind. Yeah. And has the potential to awaken the interior senses. Yes, exactly. Can, yeah, which can lead us into the direct experience of spiritual realities and mythic realities as something lived rather than just analytically yeah. conceived. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and maybe that's why people like going on vacation to Thailand or something. But, you know, you only have to go into you know, a church or some kind of ancient building or even into a, a Moroccan restaurant today or something like that. And you have a, a totally different sort of feeling within yourself and a totally different experience of, of life in a way. Yeah. I really appreciate how you explain this because it is kind of shocking how uh, disconnected we are from nature and that we are, I yeah. mean, we love symbols. I love symbols and symbolism, but we are really bogged down in in this weird world of symbols that's yeah very intellectual overly intellectualized yeah definitely so you know so maybe it's a part of the modern experience in a way because when we walk through the city um we're confronted by thousands of symbols right. in a way right so advertising uh the car is a symbol um depending on what kind of car it is but you know the ferrari is a symbol um with people's clothing are symbols, uh, posture, people's postures are signifying something to us uh, and all kinds of things, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and so we maybe we experience things sort of symbolically first because, you know, if you watch an advert for a fizzy drink, for example, um, you know, we're giving the impression through the use of, you know, attractive models and, and so on and so forth that, that if that if I drink that fizzy drink, my life will be better. So we experience it in a way first or and foremost as a symbol. Because when you drink the fizzy drink, it's usually not that tasty. <laughs> but we've we've already associated it in our mind with happiness and success and so on. And and so the aesthetic comes second, but I think for for primordial man it comes first. And then and then because it's important or lived, then it becomes a symbol. And uh, and you know and obviously this does have an effect on the world of the esoteric. So you think, of, for example, of the sword. Or, you know, most people think of the sword as a symbol of the intellect, and um, you know that's that's true, right? That's the the uh, standard uh, meaning of the symbol of the sword, whether in the tarot or in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and so on. But uh, if you ever use a sword, it's totally different, and even even. Uh, knowing how to hold a sword is actually not that intuitive, right? Because you need to hold it at some balance point uh, uh, so that so that it's not overly weighted in front of you. And um, and then you know the way you use a sword is totally d- different depending on the type of sword as well. So you know the gentleman's sword. Uh, as opposed to, you know, for example, in Kung Fu, there's the Don Dao sword, which is like a l- large machete, and it has a s- it's single bladed, so you can wrap it around your body and lean it on your shoulder, or, you know, wrap it around your neck with it touching your neck without slicing your head off. But if you had a double edged sword, you would, you know, you'd kill yourself if you did that. So, so there's a different kind of experience. And then when you use a sword like that, then, um, you know, you have a different understanding of what intellect might mean, right? It's not it's not necessarily rational, cold rational thinking. It might be something totally different. But you have to have the experience first and then and then the symbolism can come later. So seeing things like this as they truly are, for me sounds very Zen like. Would you say that this is kind of a, a golden age way of perceiving the world? Uh, Zen Buddhism. Well, or just just what you're explaining now. Um, this 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 perspective that we don't necessarily have in the modern age. Where right, we're, right. We're, yeah, that's that's definitely a part of it. Um, I think what what may make it different to say Zen Buddhism or, or merely sort of being in the moment, though that might be a, a good part of it, yeah. is the um, the underlying that there might be st- sort of structures and practices and uh, that we've forgotten about. So, you know, sure. maybe a healthy family or a healthy body. And, um, you know, uh, t- today our food is 
is often not even food. A lot of it is sort of poisonous to us. Right. And, um, you know, so, you know, being in the moment, but then eating terrible food, um, mm. I don't, that probably wouldn't be a, a golden age thing. So you could say it's a part of it, but it's not, it's not the whole of it. Uh, the rest of it would be to, you know, to have an environment that's actually nourishing of the, of the soul and the body. More of a holistic experience. Yeah, yeah definitely. You know, there's so much, there's so much to continue to go down that route with, but I do think it is kind of a natural kind of organic transition after you to circle back a little bit after you, you know, after we examine the myths of the sort of a Tubal Cain and Hephaestus and the Kabiri and all these myths of the craftsman and the fire and the, you know, the, the ore from heaven and all this. And then it makes sense because then in the forge of the blacksmith are, are created the weapons of the warrior. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Even in the saga of Sigurd, the dragon slayer, he has to apprentice to a blacksmith. Yeah. In order to be able to develop his skills and forge his sword before he can slay the dragon. Right, exactly. Yeah, there is a big link between the blacksmith and the uh, and the warrior, absolutely. And even you know, Genghis Khan um, was allegedly from a from a, a line of blacksmiths, and I believe his standard was actually a blacksmith's uh, apron on the end of a lance. So yeah, there's definitely uh, definitely a connection, and obviously you know things like uh, the sword in the stone, which would seem to allude to the the act of uh, blacksmithery as well. Um, so yeah, you definitely find this kind of connection between the blacksmith and the warrior. Well, and, I like and the what magician. you talk about and the yeah. magician, yeah, yeah. And I like what you say about about how the um, with the blacksmith there was originally so originally the kshatriya, for instance, and the um, and, and the brahmin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you have the brahmin, the kshatriya, yeah. and the the other two. But with the Kshatriya, they had their own religion. Each each strata each stratification yeah. has its own religious right, observances. Yeah. And I believe you mentioned in the book how originally the Kshatriya ha- were their own priests in a sense. Yes, that's right. And then it was taken from them and co-opted by the Brahmanic case. And yeah. I couldn't help but think about the Knights Templar in this regard because they ended up how it was a it was a kind of a rare case in the history of the Catholic Church because they were actually a church within the church and they were yeah. their own priesthood a warrior priesthood yeah. and you said so much that really rang true to me in in this examination of the warrior because you know if you think about it in like ancient uh, Roman culture you had to go through rites of purification after being at war in order to re-enter the society right. And this is exactly the same reason why there would be a different kind of spirituality for the warrior than for perhaps the householder or for the even the, yeah. the priestly case. Yeah. Because someone who is engaged in violent warfare and battle is is experiencing a different kind of life. And a religion, for instance, that says that killing is a sin, yeah. that's that's not really suitable for a warrior. No, that's right. And yet you know, what is the purpose of, of training as a warrior if everything you're doing is considered a sin? It's, yeah. it's, you know, and yet certain human beings are natural warriors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and Angel, aside from, as far as the warrior, aside from the benefits of, of training as a warrior physically and mentally, um, on the spiritual side of being a warrior, would you say that the warrior kind of embodies uh, action of movement? I mean, that's, that's what I got out of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And he's the embodiment of spirituality in action, right? So, uh, so finding maybe not enlightenment, but certainly awakening uh, in, in the heat of battle or in, training and practicing martial arts and so on and then living in a state of impermanence and 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 always having uh mortality hanging over him in a sense right right and not being passive not passively being a passenger on this journey no, but being very not active. at all yeah that's right and there is a kind of strange um 
uh, dynamic that you find in Jason and the Argonauts and uh, uh, even in the Sigurd myth with uh, with uh, Brynhilde, for example, to a certain extent. And, th- and that is that the, the warrior seems to be almost like this brute force and uh, and is is going towards his destiny, but it's very unconscious. It's sort of almost intuitive in a way, and he's just following one clue after the other, but not really, not really with a sense of an end goal all the time. Mm. Um, but uh, but and then you have the female figure uh, who appears and seems to be guiding him in some way or teaching him the mysteries in some way. So Brynhilde. Uh, uh, teaching uh, Sigurd to the the, uh, the runes and so on. Well, and I I feel as though um, it's interesting because you're you know there is that there is that um, that Dana figure or the Valkyrie figure, uh, yeah, which, which comes for the warrior. And then on the other yeah. hand, there's also if you think of like Perseus, or you think of Siegfried, uh, there's often these like incursions of these divine beings these gods or god goddess and a god or you know like odin appears you know to warriors or like Hermes and uh, minerva appear to perseus and they're always sort of stepping in at these opportune times to help the hero out of yeah basically deep shit that he said <laughs> yeah yeah that's right yeah so there is this kind of divine force that's behind the hero um whether he knows it or not. But I think at the same time, it's a required that it's not any old warrior, that it is somehow someone who's special within within the sort of warrior's ranks, who's distinguished himself and become the, kind of an elite warrior and almost demigod in his actions already. And then once he reaches that status, the, the gods are looking out for him. Now it seems like this is also a, that's also a recurrent theme in your um, book is the idea of the hero being sort of a demigod a ha, ha, has one foot and one foot. When I say the hero, I mean the person sort of traveling this path of craftsman, warrior, and magician. Yeah, you know, right. one one foot in the divine realm and one foot in the earthly realm. Could you speak a little bit on that? Yeah. So so yeah, I think that's. Um... I think that's true, and um, you know, in in regard to the warrior, you know, as I mentioned, there is this this aspect that the gods, or maybe a goddess, is looking out for the warrior and steering him in the right direction, and that he's uh, in in some sense doing the divine will, but uh, this doesn't make him a particularly nice person or a moral person from our perspective is also doing things that are pretty terrible uh, sometimes. So in, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna, the disciple of the Godhead Krishna, um, is on the battlefield complaining that he doesn't want to kill, uh, fight and kill his relatives that are on the other side. And Krishna tells him that you you have to go ahead and, and fight in battle and, and kill the other side and but he also says that it but it'll be me that is doing it you're just my instrument and um yeah so on the one hand he's doing these very earthly and earthly things uh, killing but on the other hand it's 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 uh, actually the godhead that's acting through him and uh, it's all sort of part of the mystery of life and um you know in um in tantra of course there's that right of the five m's as well um where where a person well where the initiate partakes in these prohibited um substances such as meat and grain and alcohol and then uh, sex as well and so he's doing these incredibly sort of um uh, materialistic or what would be considered to be anti-spiritual uh, things, uh, things that are going against uh, the, the tradition. And yet at the same time, that he's also being elevated through part- participating in these, uh, these prohibited uh, acts. It's, it's very interesting when you bring the moral component into the conversation because I mean, you, you spoke about um, in the book that the higher self, the unconscious, and in this case, the the most uh, 
capable warrior one can be is kind of enacting that ultimate kind of higher self of being a warrior. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have much to do with, with, you know, morals, obviously the morality of killing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you spoke about when we're talking about the higher self, people are, are attracted to uh, dancers, to, mm-hmm. to uh, maybe athletes, to musicians. Yeah. When they are able to, lose their lower self and right. fully, uh, embody their higher self. Can you maybe talk about the idea of the two selves and maybe, maybe the higher self, that whole idea? Yeah. So I think, I, you know, I, I think I actually mentioned the, the, the people of, are often attracted to people when they're sort of yeah. absorbed in some work, you know, the, we're, we're sort of um, attracted to the dancer while she's in the middle of dancing. But, not if she's actually sort of conscious of it, but more if she's sort of literally absorbed in it uh, in right. herself. And a, a friend of mine years ago uh, married uh, married a guy, and she said that she was like totally mesmerized by him, and uh, he was a barman, and he was you know f- uh, flipping cocktails up in the air and, and doing all that sort of thing, and he was like totally absorbed in it, and uh, and and that's what she seemed to find attractive. He wasn't paying her attention or anyone else any attention. He was just really absorbed in, in, in his work. And, and there was something really attractive about that. Uh, and, and, um, yes, uh, for some reason we do seem to be attracted to people who are like absorbed in something and maybe because, uh, I don't know, there's a state of kind of awakening or peacefulness or enlightenment or partial enlightenment that that seems to embody. Uh, but we definitely seem to be attracted to that. But um, yeah, so as regards to the sort of lower self and the higher self, um, you know, there's a couple of interesting uh, um, uh, anecdotes, one from Eckhart Tolle and the other from Colin Wilson, that are really weirdly uh, almost, well, not identical, but they're very, very similar, uh, certainly in spirit. And I, I don't suppose that Eckhart Tolle was aware of Colin Wilson's anecdote, but uh, beginning with Colin Wilson, uh, uh, the, the well-known author often associated with uh, books on the occult, but uh, he was actually best known for his uh, first uh, first book, The Outsider, uh, in which he mentions Gurdjieff, but um, but it's a, a little less uh, a little less focused on the occult as we might understand it. Um, but um, Colin Wilson had this uh, experience. I think he was sixteen at the time when he was at school, and uh, he thought he was going to just kill himself because he was, you know, um, maybe not depressed, but didn't really see the point in life. And he had planned that he would go into the, the science lab at school and drink some cyanide, uh, not cyanide, but uh, drink some acid that would kill him. And and he went in the next day and picked up the acid and looked at it. And he had a, had a realization that that if he drank it, the future Colin Wilson, uh, the Colin Wilson that he could become, the sort of much better Colin Wilson, would be killed. And he said it wouldn't really be a tragedy, or, and he didn't really care if, if he was killed, but it would be a tragedy if this other Colin Wilson that he could become would be killed. And he realized that he would take them both down <laughs> if he drank it, so he put it back on the shelf, and then later on became this you know famous author of you know 100-plus books. And, um, and Eckhart Tolle uh, had a similar experience where he, he realized there were two Eckhart Tolles. And he said that he had just reached a point one day where he said he could no longer live with himself. And then he said, well, who is, who is it that, that I can't live with? Or who is it that can't do the living with this, this, this other person? There's like two, uh, I can't live with myself. And so there seems to be two selves, and one is this sort of lower self, and the other one is a higher self that we can manifest. And, um, you know, I suppose traditionally the lower self would tend to be associated with the, the ego, or what in Islam is called the nafs, and with bodily cravings, you know, sexual cravings, and, uh, and so on. And we certainly have, a, we, all, we all have that, or most of us do anyway. But then the higher self, um, maybe at its most mystical, would be associated with uh, wanting to go towards the Godhead, uh, being attracted to uh, religious and spiritual experiences, and so on. But, you know, um, 
we could also include things like wanting to um, maybe like train our body and train our mind and, and other things as well that might be good for us, but that we might not want to do because it's time consuming or painful and so on. So Andrew, would you say that this higher self is, is just more of a refined version of, of maybe who we are? Um, yeah. So we, we could be rather than that side of us, which is that unconscious uh, version, like, like you were explaining with the bartender, would you say yeah. that's just a, a piece of it, or is that the? I think uh, I think what it is, you know, a lot of people when you hear them speak about spirituality will say things like, "Well, we need to have a higher consciousness," but they never say what higher is. Right, and um, it's a bit like the politician who says uh, we need to make things better. But then you mm -hmm. you ask them, "What do you mean by better?" And they they start um, getting all nervous because they know it's going to mean upsetting someone. Right. And uh, and unfortunately, the occult world is full of that sort of talk where they say, "Wow, we need a higher consciousness," but they will never tell you what they mean by that, and they probably yeah. don't actually know themselves. But um, I think the you know the higher self uh, is not some kind of snobbishness where you just like other people that aren't being as spiritual as you. It's um, it's the idea that there is a, a natural way of being and an unnatural way of being. And um, so let's say, let's uh, take the physical body around. So it's, it's unnatural to be sitting on the couch eating potato chips every night. Uh, so that would be the lower self, right? That's addicted mm -hmm. to just watching nonsense and um, eating potato chips all day and eating bad food. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with watching TV occasionally or, you know, and a, a packet of, potato chips once every while isn't going to kill you. So, um, but if you're doing this all the time and sort of addictively, it's the, the ego and it's bad for you and it's bad for your mind and it's bad for your body. And then the other extreme might be, you know, um, well, and, and then let's say, let's say the natural is going for walks, but also if we were in a natural environment, maybe we we're going on a 10 mile, uh, 10 mile track to go and hunt an animal or something like that for food for a month. Or or maybe it would be walking miles to find some new shelter or something like that. Mm -hmm. But so there will be some activity and then, you know, the, all the usual things, maybe maybe some like play wrestling or or running, uh, you know, in some kind of like play, but then, you know, sex as well and this kind of thing. But um, so, so that would be more towards the higher self if we would if we would then get out and exercise a bit and experience nature. But then I suppose that the higher self could, in a sense, um, want us to actualize the natural even more so that maybe you, you, you cultivate your body so it's even stronger or your intellect so that it's even more uh, sharp than it, than, it would, than it might necessarily need to be in nature. Or the, the spiritual, maybe we don't really need all these rituals, but maybe the higher self would encourage us to, to nonetheless practice meditation for quite a while each day or something like that. So I think the, the higher self is, is, in one sense, it's supernatural in the literal sense because it's kind of uh, related to the soul or to the Atman which itself is part of Brahman, so it's related to the soul, it's, it's a, in a sense being a part of God. Um, but, uh, but it's also supernatural in the sense that uh, it, it takes what's natural but then refines it and, um, and makes it more potent, rather like alcohol in a sense, right? So alcohol, um, it's, you know, vegetables and fruit can ferment if you just sort of neglect them, uh, I believe. But... Um, but then you can re you can refine it. You can refine vegetables or fruits to create alcohol intentionally and get something that's better tasting and, and actually more potent and, and will have a greater effect on your consciousness. And so it's, uh, I think it's a little bit like that, that you, you understand what's natural to you and beneficial to you, but then you can sort of push it beyond uh, what you might need in nature. Fascinating. Thank you. Oh, and there's also the, um, I think with, with the mystery of the magician comes the mystery of the twin and of the double in, in all these respects, you know, it, it almost seems crucial to the, 
to the mystery of what it means to act as a magician is to interact with with that reflected that reflected other the reflecting shadow you could almost say yeah yeah and, and another thing i like when we get to this part of the book that i really appreciated was the point i feel that you're making where the magician or the shaman you could say is able to travel back and forth between the states of consciousness or the worlds or the states of being. There's this traveling up and down or in and out, right? which is this sort of mobility that the magician seems to have. Right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you mean traveling between like the ego and the higher self or between the worlds or? Yes. Kind of all of the above, I feel like you're you're touching on traveling between the states of consciousness and the eras, but at the same time, also traveling between actual realms of being, or co- which is what yeah. shamans classically do. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And different states of consciousness, which and some of which might be able to link up with consciousness more broadly right so that the shaman one of the things that they would do is to be able to enter some kind of state of uh let's say light trance and be able to call someone's name mentally until until they felt that call and then the person would be uh would realize that they had to go to a particular place at a particular time and they wouldn't know why but then it would be that the shaman was telling them to go there because he would be able to link his consciousness with the with the other person's consciousness that's pretty fascinating in itself i remember years ago i was talking to a magician he was an old an older magician and um said i don't know why this came up but i said something like well I think somebody was being was had threatened him or something, and I said, "Well, mm. you know, are you going to confront him?" Or you know, or, and he's like, and he said to me, "I don't, I don't need to fight. I'm a magician. I'll deal with him through magic." <laughs> and he sure, mm. and he mean he did, he did very effectively. But it, it, I was, you know, I was fairly young, and the way he looked at me when he said that, I, it wasn't a bluff or some exaggeration or some egotistical thing it's yeah. a very matter of fact statement like i don't fight people i'm a magician i don't mm-hmm. i don't get in physical fights so then it kind of that makes me think of the difference between the warrior who's out there in the physical world yeah using the physical technology that the craftsman forged yeah and then you have the magician who has taken a step into the spiritual technology Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, there is a, a link between them as well. And that, you know, the, the warrior might be fighting um, a, an opposing army, but uh, with the understanding that, that they themselves are sort of uh, breaking natural law or going against the the uh, the rules set down by the creator, or that or that this is not the will of heaven and this kind of thing. And, you know, you find this idea of the mandate of heaven, even in ancient China, where, you know, a, a general could seize power and go to battle to, to restore this balance between heaven and earth and this sort of thing. And then the shaman, of course, is also uh, maybe doing battle with spirits that have made a person sick as well and banishing them. And in that case, the magician also needs to have aspects of the warrior uh, that warrior yeah. courage in order to right. confront things like like other spirits and yeah. also the magician him or herself just to confront the self takes yeah. quite a bit of warrior courage yeah that's right i mean all the uh, you know have looked at them individually that they're definitely traits uh, the overlap and connections between them as well. And, uh, you know, even, the, for example, the practice of cultivating chi, you know, I, I talk about that in the warrior section uh, for different reasons, but um, you, you could probably put that in the, in the magician section as well. So, And then this kind of comes full circle too, because it goes back to once you're at magician, it kind of comes full circle to blacksmith in a way because yeah. the, the blacksmiths are practicing this very primal magic of taking that stolen fire from heaven and using it to shape reality. 
Yeah, that's right. And there definitely is, um, you know, significant links between them as well. So we we'll probably think of the poet as being the craftsman, but uh, the poet is also the magician, right? So there's a definite connection between poetry and um, spells and, and magic and so on. You know, Odin is the god of poetry, for example, and he's also the god of war as well, as well as the god of magic. So. Yeah, that's a very good point. It, it does seem to be kind of hearkening back to that tripartite function that uh, yeah. Dumazil Doom, talks about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I should probably mention that, you know, my book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality, Crossman, Warrior, and Magician. Um, you know, the, re- the reason why I focus exclusively on the Crossman, Warrior, and Magician is because uh, Dumazil, who was a philologist in the 20th century, you know, made this claim that uh, ancient, uh, ancient Indo-European society was divided into those three castes. So I think you'd probably pretty find them in all cultures, actually. And, um, you know, there are other books out there that have other models of, of archetypes. But when you actually look at well, could you create a society out of these archetypes, uh, usually you, you you probably get something pretty dysfunctional. Whereas at the, the, the really, at, if you were going to start any kind of society, really you would only need craftsmen, warriors, and, and magicians, or, you know, craftspeople, the people that make things, warriors who go out hunting and defend the group because there's, there's probably going to be some trouble sooner or later. And um, and then the magicians or, the, you know, the, the village elders or the, the you know, the, the the, the individuals who are guiding uh, through wisdom and experience. Uh, that's really what you would need, and everything else would be kind of secondary, really. So I like also that you have basic practices here. So right, yeah. the, book, the book is not only theoretical. It's not just right. a historical survey and an uh, examination of esoteric, esoteric philosophy and initiatic understanding but you give opportunities for people to implement this in their lives to kind of yeah trigger the process of transformation and i I think that's very valuable yeah so so every every so there are three sections obviously one for the craftsman one for the warrior one for the magician and in the final chapter of each i I describe at least one practice that can be done but actually peppered throughout it there are the other practices that are discussed as well so which you know you could you could uh, you could do as well so and um yeah i don't you know i i like books that tell you about the history and the philosophy and the and um uh, the symbolism and so on but um you know like you i'm also a practitioner so you know i think it's important to 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 practice not just to know intellectually which which maybe comes back to our earlier discussion about uh symbols versus you know the actual experiencing of reality and of aesthetics precisely and I think that really your book is useful for somebody who is doing some kind of interior work or initiatic yeah. work, yeah. whether it's in an external order, such mm-hmm. as um, esoteric orders, Freemasonry, whether it is in mm-hmm. martial arts, yeah. which is very much like an esoteric. I mean, traditional oh, yeah. martial arts, or, we discussed this on, I think, our last visit with you. It's just, just so much of a sort of parallel between martial arts culture and uh, order, the esoteric culture. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, with uh, Chinese martial arts, you have um, and this incorporation of uh, qi or inner energy um, from, uh, from uh, acupressure and uh, related uh, sciences. And, um, yeah, and so you have this 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 notion of the chi, this energy body that can be cultivated, and that, not to mention all kinds of mythology as well. And um, you know, in the less much lesser known martial art of Zerkana, which is the Persian or Iranian martial art, uh, you know, there you find a very strong influence of uh, Sufi Islam as well, um, and they have these rituals that, that in some sense, are. are uh, very similar to Sufi rituals, 
And in India, you have Kalari Payad, and um, in there, it's a it's a, it's a martial art that looks quite a lot like the more energetic forms of kung fu, with a lot of leaping around and swords. But uh, in every uh, Kali, Kalari uh, Kalari Payat uh, temple, uh, originally at least, and probably in most today, uh, there was also an altar to the goddess Kali in one corner as well. And even in you know. Um, the modern martial art of uh, Sistema, which is a Russian martial art, uh, even there you, fi- uh, you find that they've kind of infused it a little bit with uh, Russian Orthodox Christianity. So uh, I'm not necessarily recommending anyone do this, but they have one practice where they hold their breath to the point where they, they feel it's uh, beyond their capacity, but at the same time they're saying a prayer to the Virgin Mary. So. Yeah, that's incredible uh, yeah and it's and when you, it's it's very curious right and um it's a way of controlling panic among other things but uh you know it's not a million miles away from austin ospen spares death posture you know where you would hold your breath and tense it, every part of your body and then sort of collapse and you would do this as a way of sort of entering a kind of trance state it's not it's not a million miles from that by any stretch Interesting. And, and the advantage that the warrior has, if practiced properly with the correct intention, is that yeah. uh, direct confrontation with mor- mortality. Yeah, that's right. That you don't necessarily get. I mean, you can get it with the magician, absolutely, and with the craftsman. But um, yeah. when practiced properly, the warrior uh, confronts, confronts that um, most uh, maybe vividly. Yeah, and definitely confronts uh, reality the most vividly as well, because if, if he makes a mistake, it could be his death, you know. So. And so so that knowledge uh, transfers quite nicely over into other areas, such as the craftsman and, yeah. and magician. Um, just that, that uh, sense of reality can, can really highlight uh, yeah. positive traits in an individual. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I think that confrontation with danger and death is essential to the transformation of the individual, though, and uh, the presence of death. I mean, we were talking about this before we went on the air, and um, you know, I, I was saying that death comes can come at any moment. We never know when it's going to come. Yeah, that's right. And, and at least according to an archaic perspective, we don't have a choice about when it's truly our time to die. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, even how you, you know, we were discussing about, um, you know, your 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 cat who it seemed like it was his time to die and he came back from life, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Although with a lot of coaxing from me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the mandate of heaven. <laughs> that was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And unfortunately, you know, we don't really reflect on death very seriously in the modern age. And I think we're very much almost sort of pathologically opposed to the idea of of dying. Like dying is this really terrible thing. Well, you know, it is a terrible thing, but at the same time, we can't live forever. And if we could, it would probably be awful. <laughs> you know, to know that you've got eternity of this, you know. <laughs> Listening to politicians argue year yeah. after year for eternity. Exactly, yeah, that's yeah. that's hell. <laughs> yeah, if we, if I, I would bet you that if we ever do achieve immortality in this body, people will be throwing themselves from buildings every <laughs> every day. I, I I wrote an article about uh, the importance of meditating on mortality once, and somebody, someone wrote a comment saying. Ah, well, I think it's the opposite. Imagine if we were immortal, then you'd really have an incentive to live your life properly. And I, I, and I felt like saying, well, one lifetime isn't enough for you to live your life properly. Mm, I, mean, yeah. I mean, that's what he's saying. He's actually saying, look, I can't live my life properly this time around because I'm only going to have about 80 or 90 years. That's not enough time. That's not incentive enough. It's like if that's not incentive enough, then there's a real problem. And uh, and if you do think about death more, you might actually figure out that you don't have much, to, you know, don't don't have that much time to waste. <laughs> right. It's going to come right. for you quickly enough, you know. Memento mori, and and at least yeah. at least I don't know if you know. It seems like in some of the quieter con- 
continuous traditions, it, it persists. But I know um, yeah. in the past, it used to be more, more commonly stated that initiation and training in magic and esotericism is really meant to prepare you for the after death state so that you're functional and conscious that's you know? exactly that's exactly it and um yeah that's i mean really um you know i was talking about it you know awakening this memory of, of the golden age in you but you know the the flip side of that is you, you it's the ritual the initiation rituals if they're real should definitely be preparing you for the moment of death because you want to go back into that realm where this sort of uh, golden age uh, state still exists, you know, heaven as opposed to hell. Right. So, so you, you want to live your life consciously towards that. And at the same time, when the moment of death comes, you want to be uh, conscious and thinking about the, the spiritual. So, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita says, you know, someone, uh, Krishna says, if someone meditates upon me at the moment of death, then they will, you know, come to me. But that's the, that's really the initiation ritual, right? It's showing you, uh, you know, as as uh, as a uh, Krishna does uh, on the battlefield to Arjuna, reveals his reveals his celestial form with millions of heads and millions of arms and legs. So Krishna grasps what it's all about, and the ritual shows you this sort of glimpse of the golden age of living in harmony with uh, with the Creator and with uh, with natural law and divine law and divine force as it were um, but it's also showing you okay well now you know how to live your life forward towards the moment of death and to be conscious of uh, of this uh, deity or the the ultimate being at the time of, of the time of death so you can go on to uh, to heaven or to uh, you know a, a more advanced realm rather than getting sucked back into the cycle of samsara you know in the Bardo Thodol, it also talks about this where it describes the different colors and types of light and the opportunities a discarnate human mm-hmm. has within that very short window as yeah. they're dying to either uh, escape reincarnation altogether or to at least attain a favorable next incarnation where spiritual practice would lead to liberation. Right. And that's even in the Egyptian scriptures as well, where you're meant to memorize, you have to memorize certain spells in order to be functional in the other world. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You see that with the Gnostics and yeah, with the uh, Tibetan book of the dead, you again need that courage. You know, once you move into that afterlife you'll move into a place of of uh light and good feelings and if you're too complacent with that whole uh, situation then you might be reborn and then the next step is to go towards the more malicious and scary uh uh beings and if you're too fearful then boom you're you're reincarnated again there potentially so yeah. you've got to have that balance of of wisdom and courage to to kind of navigate that scenario. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and just uh, getting back to meditation on death, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I forget the, the exact period. I think it was the 1600s that, uh, you know, wealthy patrons, when they had their portrait painted, they would often have a, a picture of a skull painted on the back, which you couldn't see, of course. Hmm. But it was a reminder of their own death. You know. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. Well, Angel, I'm so grateful that you agreed to come on the show again. We, I think we both felt like we were, our, our insights about, that arose from this book were definitely valuable. I think it's an, I would prescribe this book for somebody that was going to be entering an initiatic order of some kind, or a, even just a system of esoteric or magical study, because Something really valuable here you've provided is kind of an underpinning, a sort of underpinning and a way to look at things that gives you a, an idea of the bigger picture while at the same time helps to guide you through the phases of a process of development that arises from uh, practical work. Right, yeah. And so personally for me, for somebody who is working actively along a certain system, this is an excellent guidebook to kind of help you see, okay, like this is where I am. This is where I'm headed. 
you know, and um, these are some, these are some ways to perhaps deepen the experience or amplify the experience, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and give context to the experience. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much for coming on and talking to us and being our guest again. Oh, thank you. It's great talking to you again. Yeah, it's been great, Angel. And, and the book, again, is, is wonderful. And congratulations and, and good thank luck. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hopefully you won't have to take out your um, fencing gear, or your katana in this uh, Mad Mex atmosphere we're in. Mad Max. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Mad Max is a Mexican <laughs> chain. <laughs> Mad Max. <laughs> Okay, that was Angel Millar coming straight from New York to discuss his new book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality. We both greatly enjoyed this uh, release from Inner Traditions um, by Angel. It was excellent. It was highly anticipated and well worth the wait. I think it makes an excellent manual for a person who may be either entering into or passing through initiation. And when I say initiation, I don't only mean initiatic orders such as Freemasonry or, uh, you know, any of the esoteric orders out there. Um, but I also mean even traditional initiation in the um, esoteric, but also perhaps indigenous uh, tradition or magical tradition. Uh, because what he describes is a sort of process of consciousness that occurs uh in the subject who passes through the phases of development and initiation. He also provides a lot of excellent contextual information that would help a person to orient themselves in the sort of timeless cosmos of, uh, you could say, eternally recurring uh, myth themes. Um, Besides that, some of the... um, practical material he offers in each chapter to actually ground this information in lived experience is useful and it's a nice and refreshing um, sort of contrast to what you see sometimes which even in excellent books that come out often they may tend to be more illustrative or um, descriptive i think the practical component is often lacking through no fault of many authors just through a general trend And when you include a practical component to any text, what happens is you end up having something that can be integrated into your daily life, which is, I think, what the goal is here. Because the only way to truly experience the phases of development that we find in the survey is to live them. And an initiation should do, among other things, exactly that, help you to live life more fully. There's not really much more I can add that was that was well said, and it pretty much covers my thoughts as well. Um, the book is very uh, wide ranging um, it's it's very poetically written but yet thoughtful um, it's it's not fanciful i mean it, angel's a, a really uh well thought out author he you could tell he's taken a lot of time with this and um, it's a work that I think he should be proud of and I think he is proud of. As you mentioned, it is a good book for those um, going through initiation or planning on going through initiations, either through an order formally or um, self-initiation potentially. But yes, we would highly recommend the book and uh, much luck to Angel. I hope that it does very well. And I wanted to add um, another point I'd like to make is that in modern Western culture, which has become sort of decentralized and somewhat alienated from its roots, uh, the plight of uh, many men is a sense of disconnection um, with the deeper meaning of what it means to be male, to engage the masculine dimension of experience in our reality. And another aspect of Angel's work here is to help men, I believe, to reconnect to the more profound, the more indigenous, the more aboriginal, archaic, uh, masculine 
qualities of spirituality. And I, I think by reading this book, um, many men might also be able to sort of find the threads like Theseus in the Minotaur's Labyrinth that will lead them back to a spiritualized masculinity, which I believe is an antidote to much of the sort of postmodern confusion that we're seeing in today's culture. Uh, I hope, and I would find it deeply interesting to see maybe Angel pen a companion volume to this, exploring the feminine roles of initiation or the feminine experience of initiation. Um, I think it's very, when I was reading this book, it occurred to me that it would be interesting to explore the archetypal patterns that women experience when they pass through the initiatic process. Yeah. And uh, I I like that. Um, I I don't think though that this book is, I think this book can also be very valuable to females. I don't think that it's a male centric book necessarily, although I could definitely see where you're going with that. Um, I couldn't help but thinking of Peladon's uh, mage and fairy guidebooks for for men and women when you were saying that that's a good point okay so having said all that i think now it's time to move on to our new segment unless you have something else and so let's cue the reading rainbow sound effects and go into the book review so today i'm going to talk about a book that i really feel strongly about that um I've been reading and rereading now for a year or so, and it is... Is that 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 book, My Mom is a Hooker? Um, No, that's going to be next episode. So you jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, So for this episode, (laughs) for this episode, the book is The Awakening of Faith, and it is attributed to an author named Asphagosha, but... um, There are a few different versions of the book. The one I have and that I would recommend is translated and with commentary by Yoshito Hakeda. And so the the book was originally written in Sanskrit and it was translated into Chinese in uh, I think the mid 500s CE. Um, It it was an extraordinarily and is an extraordinarily influential um, text and has had dozens of commentaries written on it. But it's it's somewhat unknown in the West, I believe. So what really defines this book for me and makes it extra interesting is its straightforward nature. It's extremely concise and focused. Uh, some would say maybe terse. It, it is lacking a lot of the flowery language and the mythological imagery that you see in the sutras. And it's actually, that's by design. So the central goal of the work is to provide a practical framework for improved comprehension and practice of very complex principles. So, for instance, it attempts to answer a lot of the big questions of uh, like non-duality, consciousness, what is consciousness, what is identity, what is ignorance and enlightenment, and by extension, the concepts of good and evil can be extrapolated and explored. Um, so it, it does a very good job at, at digging really deep into those ideas. Another central theme is uh, one mind, two aspects. And this is an idea um, of mutually inclusive, although sometimes perceived as paradoxical states of mind. And these states of mind are the absolute and the phenomenal, phenomenal being samsara or the uh, state of birth and death. And the idea is that reality is conceived at the intersection of the absolute and the phenomenal. The absolute, although transcendental, it's not outside of the phenomenal. And the phenomenal, while temporal, is not outside of the absolute, that they're ontologically identical. So I found that concept and those ideas to be extremely um, fascinating. And the, the book really kept my attention throughout. Um, it's, like I said, extremely concise and brilliant, in my opinion. And it's under 100 pages. So um, and, and in that 100 pages, a, a good portion of that is commentary, which is it's very good commentary. 
Um, it's not unwieldy by design. Like I said, it's, it's supposed to be practical. And so uh, I would highly recommend it. Again, that is The Awakening of Faith by Asphagosha, translation and commentary by Yoshida Hakeda. And I think that this book is um, really, you can see the underpinnings of esoteric Buddhism in a lot of this book too. I mean, the very idea of the interpenetration of the two aspects is very similar to say the, uh, the interpenetration of mind and body mm-hmm. in tantrism, for instance. Um, there's certainly, uh, I can see developments even from perhaps Shankya philosophy. Um, so there's, there's ways you can sort of see this as a, not only an isolated monolithic work, but a work, a peak in a tradition that extends even maybe uh, to a time before Buddhism. And I definitely see parallels in the sayings of the uh, Stoic philosophers as well as even uh, even the Druids and some of the writings of uh, you know Druidic masters. And, and that's because wisdom is like a tree with many fruits or a plant with many flowers. And I believe the awakening of faith is certainly a, a great flower of wisdom. Yeah, exactly. And um, it was a foundational work um, uh, that was used by Kukai, which we talked about in previous episodes on Shingon Buddhism. He felt that this work was also very important, very influential Mahayana text. Well, thanks for doing that book review, Dominic. No problem. So as always, you can follow us on Facebook and YouTube. You can Make sure to like us and subscribe and comment and give us a review. That's always very helpful. I also want to give a shout out to our listeners in Sweden. We seem to be doing well on the charts in Sweden. So uh, to our Swedish listeners, I'd just like to say tack. And that is it for today, unless you have something else. Uh, just that uh, we love you, Sweden. And we love all the people from all the different countries that are listening to this podcast. We're always open to suggestions. Please share your comments, your ideas. Um, uh, We also intend, I want to make a mention of something here. We intend to keep this podcast uh, fully free. We, uh, We do have day jobs, so we do not depend on the podcast to support ourselves. We do this as a labor of love. That said, we are grateful for our Patreon supporters, uh, but we will never uh, be having a secret member section only. We believe that wisdom is free. It's yours because it's free and wisdom is everywhere. All we are doing is attempting to focus the lens of the eye of the mind upon those things that might edify the soul. So with that said, stay safe, practice social distancing, meditate, make art, make love, write, draw, make talismans, do push-ups, fencing, yoga, kickboxing, judo, pet your pet, eat some food, cook some food appreciate the relationships you have do whatever you need to do to get through this but stay positive and that's a wrap yeah and judo without partners so that's that's i'm sure there's some drills you can do (laughs) (laughs) all right see you next time